Number 74, People v. Ronald K. Johnson. May it please the court, counsel, Timothy Davis, on behalf of Mr. Johnson, if I could please reserve two minutes for rebuttal. You have two minutes. Thank you. Mr. Johnson was denied his right to due process as the entirety of the seven years and eight months of pre-indictment delay was marked by negligence on the part of both the police and the district attorney's office at every step of the way. This court has held that uh, negligent actions on the part of police and prosecutors that causes uh, a lengthy period of pre-indictment delay may not be excused by simply negligent conduct. Counsel, Just one or two years. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, in these types of cases, I always struggle a bit with our role in reviewing the balancing of the factors. So h how do you see that? I mean, we may think they balance out differently than the appellate division. Is, is that what we're doing here? Are we doing a rebalancing based on our own perception of the factors? Or if they've applied the factors correctly, well then is our role just to say it's clear error somehow uh, based on the record, uh, how they interpreted the, the weight to give those factors? And, and I, I just, I'm, I just, I, I would like to get your view of that because it's something in other cases I think I've struggled with. Well, I think Judge Fahey in Wiggins made clear, I think that this court uh, looks at it uh, afresh and weighs the, the factors as it sees fit. Like a de novo yes. type of review. Yes. Okay. And, uh, but your view, as I understand it here, your argument is that you have your arguments on that, that the weighing was done incorrectly but also that the way they actually looked at the factors themselves was incorrect, particularly at the time of the motion versus at the time of the later appellate division decision. Yes, th there is a Concepcion and LaFontaine uh, problem here in that uh, the appellate division looked at this case and analyzed it in rather a, a bizarre fashion that as far as I, I know has not been repeated and there was no uh, precedent for that. The um, trial court, looked at the factors before, before trial, and uh, all five, and denied the defendant's uh, application based on the court's application of the five Taranovich factors. Um, <clears throat> when it got to the appellate division, the appellate division uh, looked sort of from the, the back end of this to determine whether there was any prejudice by looking at what the defendant actually pled guilty to. Uh, the indictment had... Was, uh, was it proper to limit it to looking at it from what he pled guilty to? Uh, no, no, I, I don't believe so. So is that a legal error? Yes. So should we reverse on that basis and remit? Yes, but I also believe that based upon the fact that the, there is no uh, issue uh, with regard to fact that I would ask this court to, to, to rule on it rather than remanding it to the appellate. When you say there's no issue with regard to fact, you mean we do that fresh Taranovich weighing on our own and we come to the conclusion that it should be dismissed? Is, is that what you're saying? Yes, I, I believe based upon what Judge Fahey wrote in, in Wiggins, I believe that is what uh, this court can do and what I would be asking this court to do. Counsel, to go back to your point on, which I take, that it, we look at the factors at the time the motion's made. So here there's, um, there's these two charges. I think then to be consistent, you would also look at the nature of the underlying charge at that time. So at the time the motion's made, it's, it's two counts. It's rape in the first degree and second degree. So if we're looking at all of the factors at the time the motion was made, as we weigh that factor, which I think is three, we're looking at both charges as well, right? Yes, yes, Judge. And, and it seems also to get to how they interpreted the factors, the appellate division seemed to say, assuming arguendo that the people failed to establish good cause for the protracted delay, 
such that the second and third factors favor defendant. And I'm having some trouble understanding why it would be also the third factor would also favor defendant just based on your conclusion as the second factor, which is what they seem to be doing there. Uh, I believe what the court did was look at the case law, which indicates that in looking at the serious nature of the offense, you look at what serious means with regard to the amount of work that has to go into Absolutely. this case. So here, uh, with regard to the both rapes, you have, or both allegations, excuse me, both counts, you have uh, DNA, you have uh, no issue as to the age of the complainant when this occurred, and you have no issue uh, with regard to uh, the age of the uh, perpetrator. So at least with regard to uh, the second count, uh, there is, this is, even though this is a very, very serious but we look at both counts, right, because of the timing of the motion. We're not only going to look for you know, purposes of the f one factor at, at the time the motion was made, and, and later, oh, no, it's only one count. So it's first and second. And the first degree is incapacitated victim, right? Right. And then you have a minor victim. So wouldn't that affect the complexity of the investigation? Because, yes, you could have DNA evidence, which eventually they had here, but... You also have a minor victim who was incapacitated. And don't you have to look at all those factors? Right? You do, but the court is looking at this eight years after an incident was alleged to have occurred. So we know based upon the uh, investigation by the police within the first four years that there were no other witnesses to this incident. Uh, this is not a case where there may be, if we just delay for another year, somebody's going to come forward. So do you know when the... When the defendant's D do we know when the defendant's DNA was entered into CODIS? Yes, it was uh, four years. No, I, don't, I don't mean when it was when the match was made, when it was actually entered oh, into the system. I, I'm sorry, yes, it was entered into the system four years before the incidents alleged to have occurred. Okay. And that's in the record somewhere? That is in the record, yes. So should the delay that the time it took for the lab to finally analyze it weigh against the people? Yes, yes and no. If at some, at some point when there is a delay that is so extensive with regard to a lab, uh, their, their build up, whatever else, there's going to come a point in time when there has to be uh, a due process violation simply based upon the fact that it's the people's responsibility. Right, but here it was compounded by the fact that she was unconscious, so she wasn't able to say X person did it by identifying them. Well, well, two things. One is the police had the ability to ask for the testing to be expedited. And they did not do so at the beginning, even though... There was a backlog generally. Yes, but what the, um, what the scientists testified to was that based upon the allegations here, a minor uh, alleged to have been raped, that uh, if there had been a request for the testing to be expedited, this would actually have gone to the top of the line and been tested right away. But is there, so, is there any, uh, anything in the record that uh, the police made some analysis and came to a conclusion not to request some expedited treatment? I mean, did they think about it at all? Uh, if they thought about it, it's not, it's not in the record, not but the there's record. certainly nothing in the record that that they was... They never argued that. They never argued that. But they that. made some calculation, discretionary determination that under the circumstances they were not going to seek that given the backlog or whatever else. Yes, the case. yes. Okay. And I, I, I think I, one of the biggest delays was also uh, the victim survivor didn't want to cooperate with law enforcement. Do you think that that's unreasonable that you wait until someone is ready to testify in a case like this? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think the record, um, and I'm not quite sure based upon the record, where this notion that she was uh, an uncooperative witness actually comes from. Uh, she, when she first went to the hospital, she had said a number of things, including that she had actually been sexually assaulted. Based upon the record, it appears that she then saw a rape counselor who told her that she should be in touch, keep in touch with the police. Was while it a, but then they went and spoke to her biological mother who told the police she's in contact with me, and maybe that wasn't exactly accurate. So not that she wouldn't cooperate, but w was it more of an instance of them not being able to contact her directly for her input as to how she wished to proceed? 
Well, this actually come, is an issue where the, where the police really did, did nothing. Uh, after the um, CODIS match, the investigator made two calls to, to the mother, um, and it actually isn't clear because at some point later, I believe on cross-examination, the investigator indicates that maybe he was not the person who actually made the calls, and that may, this may actually have been one message after the other. He then says that he, he checked city records, not sure exactly what that is, uh, but did nothing else. But isn't it complicated by the fact that she was a foster child? So he's contacting a mother who's not a custodial parent and may in fact have a, com a complicated relationship with the alleged victim? That does make it uh, more difficult, but here, uh, the, the child was of school age and there was no attempt to actually check the school district, Rochester City School District records to see if there was an address or a forwarding address or if to, the actual name or address of the foster parent. Um, there is also, if you look at investigator Siersma, when he then is, is requested by the eventual prosecuting attorney to try to contact her, it takes him like uh, you know, 18 hours or two days and he's actually contacted her and meeting with her. To, to, to look at them what, what judge, or excuse me, what investigator Connor did versus that, um, investigator Connor simply waited and other those two calls did nothing. So your, your argument is they simply didn't diligently investigate the case? It was negligent, yes, Your Honor. And in People versus Staley, uh, in this court, just uh, two years after Taranovich, the court wrote that uh, sheer neglect or trifling is not acceptable. This court also wrote in Vernace, or Venacci, I'm not sure, that a determination made in good faith to delay prosecution for su sufficient reasons may uh, eliminate or answer the question whether the defendant was denied due process. And, and Judge Wilson, I think this goes to your point, which is um, there has to actually be a determination. This simply cannot be you know, wandering along uh, against a serpentine wall hoping that you come out at the end someplace that may lead to an indictment or not. Uh, thank you, counsel. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Kaylin Porter on behalf of the people. Uh, I'll start with a point that was brought up by Judge Garcia in terms of this court's review powers. Uh, and while it's not necessarily borne out in my brief, I do believe that this court's analysis as to most of the factors constitutes a mixed question. The line that's in Wiggins is attempting to distinguish itself from most of the cases that have come before this court in which this court has found that there is record support for good cause, there's record support for the fact that there's no due process violation, and this court's then accepted the facts as they are in the record. That might solve the problem of our review on the second charge, uh, which was the one that was pleaded to, but it doesn't help us with the first charge, which was never uh, at least reviewed at the appellate division. So, so what do we do there? Your honors, you're referencing prejudice. And uh, so the, uh, the prejudice prong is different. And I do believe that that would be the only real question of law before this court is the analysis that was used by the appellate division in terms of the relevance of a satisfied count in, in terms of prejudice. And as Justice Garcia noted, the time that the motion is decided, uh, prejudice should not be looked at as it exists only at the time the motion is decided. In fact, that's never been the case before this court. Most of those five factors at the time the motion is decided are immutable. The length uh, of the delay, the time it takes between defendant's crime and when defendant is indicted, that's not changing by what anything. Is, what is the, uh, the Nisi Prius court deciding then? I mean, they're deciding something based on the factors before them and the record before them. Right, and that's what gets appealed, no? Correct, Judge Rivera. So the, uh, the court is looking at all five factors, but the relevance of prejudice... So aren't we analyzing whether or not these decisions are correct? Isn't that what we're deciding? That at that time, with what you knew at that time, you were making a decision. The, 
as to what the uh, trial court decided, a reviewing court has always looked to prejudice that existed after the fact. It's not simply locked into what was alleged at the time that the motion was decided. Now, like I said, those other factors are immutable at the time. However, prejudice where, for example, where a defendant proceeds to trial, a court has looked to how prejudice has played out at the trial. This court has that in People v. Decker, where uh, the court looked at how the witnesses testified as to whether defendants claims of prejudice, which this may is, have been- This is a plea. This is a Does plea, Your matter? Honor. Correct. So uh, the, uh, but the court though has always looked to prejudice as it could develop even after the time of the motion. And this is consistent with any other prejudice analysis that comes before the court because a reviewing court has oh, the benefit. I'm confused. Are you arguing that then the, the court should have considered what the prejudice would be if he went to trial on, on both counts? No, Your Honor, because defendant was not convicted of the rape one. So he's, he's never going to be convicted of the rape well, one. Well, don't so you think his position in plea bargaining might be somewhat weaker uh, because of the delay on the first count, as to the first count? That is, the second one, right, is, is just based on the age, and right? But the first count, there's other information that a defendant might try to collect to disprove the first count, right? That was what he alleged. Right. And if the delay had only been six months instead of eight years, that might affect the defendant's ability, the strength of how, how, his, how he might perceive his defense on the first count. And I, I would say, Judge Wilson, the, a defendant's decision whether or not to plead guilty, whether or not to go to trial, whether to have a bench trial, a jury trial, has never been part of a Taranovich analysis. The uh, five factors that this court has continuously looked at as to the prejudice analysis, there's no room in the prejudice analysis for a defendant's decision uh, as to whether or not to go to trial, whether or not to plead guilty. It's simply whether a defendant has demonstrated actual prejudice. Really, so if, if the, imagine if a different first count, right, or, or it could be the same first count, where there was evidence that would have clearly exculpated the defendant of the first count, but it's now disappeared because of the, because of the length of the delay. And the defendant now is in a different position in plea bargaining, right? Can't, can't say, look, you, you can't prosecute me for the first count because I've got an ironclad defense. That defense is lost and is now facing two different counts. Don't you think there's some prejudice there? No, Your Honor, because I don't, because there's no remedy really that would exist. So if we're saying that there was such a severe level of prejudice to a top count that defendant was not convicted of, if we're saying then that the trial court erred in not dismissing that one well, count. If the defendant took the plea to the second count because of the threat of conviction under the first count that wouldn't have existed but for the delay. And I, I understand the, the argument that defendant has made in that respect, but I would simply ask this court to not uh, not include a defendant's plea bargaining calculus as part of a Taranovich analysis. The Taranovich analysis is whether the prosecution should be able to bring these charges against defendant in spite of the passage of time. So, Here. so then on that, on that first count, I, I, you will correct me if I've misread the record. As I understand it, defendant did make an argument about prejudice. Am I, am I wrong on that? He did how okay, did you all object? Did you present any counter argument? It would be the defendant's burden to establish but actual but prejudice. I'm asking you, did you? I mean, you objected generally. Did you object on the prejudice issue specifically? It would be the defendant's burden to show I prejudice. Understand. The people do is not that, have to. Is that a no then? Uh, the prejudice was simply mentioned in defendant's motion papers. I do believe that the people then countered with the fact that defendant has not shown actual prejudice, of which it would be his actual burden. The prejudice that was alleged here pertains only to the rape in the first degree charge. He acknowledges that there would be no prejudice to the rape second because it's a strict liability crime. However, the prejudice that he alleged has been routinely dismissed by this court as being general routine-like claims of prejudice. And those types of prejudice are inherent in any delay. Of course, you're not going to be able to contemporaneously investigate because the charges are brought later. That is inherent in any delay and that is never constituted. Well, because in if they're inherent doesn't mean that under the particular facts of the case, they don't matter, right? It, that has, it's always been dismissed as a routine general allegation that has never been sufficient as an actual showing of prejudice. And the defendant does have to show actual prejudice to his claim. Well, and what about the DNA testing? Did, did you have no control over that? Wasn't there a process in the lab where you could have said, you know what, this is a rape case, it's important. 
Can you get us to the top of the line? The, uh, the expert from the, uh, from the lab did testify that there was a priority request form that could have been filled out. As the trial court found, none of uh, the reasons as to why a person would file that priority request form were triggered or implemented in this case. So I would how, how could that be, though, when we were waiting, I think it was almost two years uh, to get a test? Why doesn't that trigger a priority list? Or the pe like some, why, does, why don't the people feel the pressure uh, to act when you have the evidence and your only delay is coming from the lab when we're talking about someone's liberty? I do believe that the backlog here was extraordinary. The, there was uh, almost a thousand cases that were waiting analysis at, at the lab at the time that uh, this case was being investigated. And hundreds of those, in fact, the majority of those cases were sexual assault But did law enforcement, given, the, given that backlog, have some kind of internal protocol to assess when they might take perhaps what you would argue is an exceptional step of asking for a priority? Because uh, they obviously did ask for priorities somewhere along the line, not necessarily in this case, because it was familiar to the lab. Uh, there was nothing in the record here that would suggest that the, uh, that the police made any sort of decision that they would need to do that in this case. Uh, and I would ask the court to adopt the, find the factual finding of and the trial And there's nothing court. in the record as to whether or not there was any such internal process? Uh, the only thing in the record was the, uh, uh, the forensic biologist testimony that th one existed. However, her testimony was that there are certain types of cases where it would be more appropriate for them to file a priority request form, such as where there's a trial deadline or where there's a hearing deadline or where there's an approaching statute of limitations and they need to get uh, that particular DNA tested more so expeditiously. So are you arguing that because of the volume of the backlog, there were a number of competing cases to be expedited that unfortunately pushed this one back further? We don't know how many priority request forms were outstanding. That uh, was not part of the record, but what was part of the record was the hundreds of sexual assault cases that were waiting to be right. tested. And I, I, I would ask this court to not put on the police that a priority re request form needs to be uh, sent in every sexual assault case, every serious case, or else it's not considered to be uh, an important process to the people. The people uh, have a number, hundreds of sexual assault cases waiting to be tested. They're waiting for those DNA results so that they can initiate prosecution. Yeah, fair enough if there was something in the record that suggested that, that law enforcement made, made a determination given its internal protocols that it just couldn't in this case no matter how serious, no matter how consequential, there were other cases that should be at the top of the list, and they just couldn't see their way on this case. But you're, you've said there what, is no such. I, I don't believe there was an investigator. Nothing in the record that shows that. that. Uh, well, there was based on the uh, forensic biologist testimony and the trial. Well, that course. there exists a protocol, and that's not my question. My question is, I, I, I'm asking the general question. If you, if it's in the record, fine that there's nothing in the record that law enforcement went through the exercise of making a decision that they would not pursue expeditious treatment in this case, I, I even don't, though they could have done that. I don't believe that there was any specific note that an investigator made that determination, but I would also highlight then for the court that what the investigators were looking at at that time was a victim that was deemed uncooperative, that had no way of identifying her attacker. Uh, the case was for several years closed as victim uncooperative. Uh, this was not necessarily a, a case that they would be looking to get that priority on because they didn't even have a cooperative victim at that point. And I, I do see that my time is up, so unless the court has any additional questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the people in, in the brief uh, indicate that um, this court has looked backwards to see whether or not there's actual prejudice in these cases. Uh, the two cases that people cite, the first one is People versus Decker. In that case, the motion before the trial court had been denied without a hearing. Uh, not sure, based upon this court's decision, what the actual pleading showed, but the court indicated when stating that the hearing was not, in fact, necessary based upon the pleadings uh, indicated that there was no indication of prejudice by the delay. The other case that the people cite, U.S. versus Marion, 
In that case, it was a federal case uh, which requires a showing of specific prejudice, and the um, district court dismissed the case as premature because there were the allegations of prejudice, but until they were actually shown and proven, there could be no dismissal under the United States Constitution. With regard to um, whether this is a mixed question of law and fact, uh, Judge Fahey was quite clear that this court has never looked at Taranovich issues as one of mixed, uh, a question of mixed law and fact. With regard to prejudice, we do not concede that there was no prejudice. It's quite clear that under Taranovich and this court's decision in, in Singer, when the delay becomes of a certain length, there is no need, the defendant does not need to show prejudice. In this case, we do have uh, prejudice, I believe, under the fourth prong, where uh, Mr. Johnson was serving a sentence on another crime. The police knew that he was in custody, uh, and by delaying, it deprived Mr. Johnson of the possibility of a concurrent sentence. Counsel, I see your, your lights on before we finish here. I, I, I wanted your thoughts. What I, another thing I struggle with in weighing these factors is where does the victim fit in? Right, so we have a minor victim who's incapacitated, that's the charge, right? So it affects obviously some of the statute of limitations issues on, on, on certain crimes, it's a different issue. Um, but it, that does get to the sense of these are difficult victims, they sp present particular challenges. Um, and this one, I think there's some indication in the record, at least at the trial court, had other issues as well. Um, does that factor into the reason for the delay? Does it factor into the nature of the charges? Does it factor even into potentially reasons for the government delay that we should look at differently because of the nature of the victim that we have here and the special challenges this victim faces? <clears throat> um, yes. Under Decker, this court excused the uh, delay because the witnesses to the offense were drug addicts and other, um, other things, and so at the time of the uh, offense, they would not have made good witnesses. After a passage of time, they sobered up, and then um, the, uh, the people were able to then go forward to the prosecution, and this court held that in Decker, that was, a, that was, that was reasonable. Um, unfortunately, as Your Honor indicated, these are difficult questions, and uh, if the victim were truly uncooperative, then that would excuse some of the time here. I don't believe the record indicates that that is, that is actually the case, and that also must then be weighed against what the investigator does to actually track her down. What's clear is, at this point, years before the case goes to the, uh, to the grand jury, this victim contacted the police through um, a counselor she had who was married to a police officer. Uh, yet still, it took the police and the prosecutor more than uh, 18 months at that point to put the case into the grand jury. So I, I would argue that that is taking into account the victim's special circumstances, but does not excuse what the police did and the prosecutor in this case. Thank you.